My name is Colin Weiser. I'm the Silber Family Professor of Modern Jewish Studies and Acting Director of York University's Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight to Monsters, Machines, and Modern Jews, an evening with Nathan Englander. Tonight's event would not be possible without the very generous support of Drs. Michael and Amira Dan, from whose home we are broadcasting tonight, if that's the right word to use in today's world of Zoom virtual webinars. Monsters, Machines, and Modern Jews is part of a larger series of Canadian Jewish literary programs that have made the Koshitsky Center one of the preeminent hosts and curators of programming about Jewish life and letters in Canada. These events include not only book launches and interviews with authors, but also the annual Canadian Jewish Literary Awards, the CJN's Young Writers Contest, and the Canadian Jewish Literary Fiction Panel. We are extremely excited to have as our guest tonight, best-selling acclaimed author, Nathan Englander, a New Yorker who has made Toronto his home. He will be joined in conversation by my colleagues, Professor Sarah Horowitz, another New Yorker who has chosen Toronto as her home, and Toronto born and bred Professor David Kaufman, York's shift chair in Canadian Jewish studies. And if you haven't figured it out by now, I of course am from New York too. Before commencing tonight's event, it's important that we recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University's campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tecaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. At this point, I would like to introduce to you my Koshitsky Center colleague, Dr. Amira Dan, whose fantastic idea it was to organize tonight's event. Uh, good evening. Uh, it is an honor to, to bring to you the, uh, the author of uh, for the relief of unbearable urges, uh, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, uh, dinner at the center of the earth, uh, Kaddish.com, um, a poet of, of, of the Jewish stories, but of universal reach, uh, playwright and translator, uh, Nathan Englander. The audience is out there. Nice. Welcome. Hi, Avon. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, we chose uh, tonight's, the title for tonight's chat, Monsters, Machines, and Modern Jews, because we wanted to create a tent you know, capacious enough uh, for our conversation with you to be similarly capacious to fan out in all kinds of directions to and fro, because your writing is likewise capacious. It's really gloriously all over the place. Um, your books have been set in and around Israel, uh, across the global Jewish diaspora, and they deal with um, a pretty wide range of religious and philosophical and ethical questions with uh, geopolitics and nationalism, um, uh, with war and love and death and a whole lot more. Uh, one of your more recent books, Kaddish.com, uh, is about the internet and its impact on uh, the most intimate filial emotions in Jewish religious life, a machine of sorts, a monstrous one perhaps, uh, that is refashioning uh, Jewish life probably more than any other machine has done in uh, the last few hundred years. So I'd like to offer this as a start point, but I also want to cast two wider nets in case you prefer to answer these ones on this theme. Um, uh, either this specific internet question, uh, or you want to tell us about uh, the most significant monsters or machines that are kind of impacted or collide with modern Jewish life, 
or if there are specific Jewish machines or Jewish monsters that you'd like to start us off with. No, oh, it's a little bento box of a, I get to choose. Um, oh, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, first of all, it's so nice to be here. Um, this is my first time in big boy pants in like two years. It's so nice to be here with people. Um, and it's a Jewish event. My mom's probably watching. They fed me very well before <laughs> I am sated. Um, oh, that's such a good question. Uh, a 96 parter. I guess they all mash up together, which is, uh, Thank you for doing your homework. You're like, I know you're gonna answer 11 questions if I ask one. So I ask 11, maybe I'll answer one question. Um, we'll see if it works backwards. But yes, I. Uh, so the last novel is Kaddish.com. You don't know, I, I always, always, always call it playing your own grad student, which is, I just tell stories. Like I can still remember the shock after my first book where they're like, you're a Jewish writer. And I was like, what? I literally had no idea, even though, everything and all my work is so, so, so Jewish. I just wrote a rough draft of a story that basically my wife and agent have read. Those are two separate people. But um, yeah, my wife's like, there's no Jews. And it's my first Juden Ryan story, I think, <laughs> in, uh, ever. But yeah, you're not necessarily aware of your themes. Like I talk about people and people are Jewish to me and the things that happen in the world are Jewish things and the worries are Jewish. Like it's, it's not a subset of humanity. It's a fully formed world. So um. I feel like it's only after the books are written that I can see the book before the last book, prior to cottage.com is dinner at the center of the earth, which is, um, I was talking about this with Kalman, but having left Jerusalem, you know, I really was living there for a peace process. I'm still a naive, like the world is always at war and there's now Europe is at war. I can't believe I'm saying that as I sit here, but I am just a naive. I'm so hopeful. You know, I'll say to my like, you know, of course this person will go to jail. They did bad things. And, you know, that that really kills at dinner again and again. <laughs> like someone go to in power for their crimes. Oh, that's ridiculous. Anyway, so I've been writing I the heartbreak. I'm finally old enough as I sit here, you know, gray at the temples with my COVID body. I'll take my shirt off at the end for everyone. But um, I just, I lived in Jerusalem when the peace was happening and it was right there. The fact that as we are watching, you can decide, it's just a few people, you know, I have, there's, you can't see around the room. There is so much history, like world history in this room that you say like, you know, what undid Sarajevo? And you say, you know, four people who just wanted to fuck the whole thing up. That's yeah. it. Not the good people who want to live together. Not the hundreds of years. You know, like I, I watched that. I lived in Malawi for my wife's research. And I just remember being at a funeral at a Catholic church and all the Muslims were sitting outside. And I said, I've never seen two communities get along better. I was like, who's going to try to light this one on fire? Because I've never seen a more peaceful coexistence between the most deeply religious people of different faiths. So my heartbreak at a lost piece that was right there. I lived it. There was a two state solution. And just cause it's 20 years ago, is it 30 years ago? You know, nine, you know, 2000. So 22 years ago, just cause a few people chose to blow it up. I want you to know, and I wanted to write a book about this. It was happening. It was real. It was not a dream. It was not, you know, I've, you know, got to like talk to Martin Indyk about this, like the people who were putting it together, it was there. You know, so I was writing this book about, you know, Israel and Palestine, about the politics. And then in my head, there's another Jerusalem that's mystical and magical. And that's what Kaddish.com was, is like that Jerusalem that's outside of politics and outside of space. And you're like, I asked you four questions, none of which you've started answering. But <laughs> you ask right. about the Internet part of it, because that book is a journey book that takes us to Jerusalem. I was just, you know, as society, it's a cycle. So it crumbles all the time. But why I mentioned the naive part is like, and I'm sure we'll get to the modern moment. Like I really thought like me growing up and, you know, the getting chased home from school or fighting because you're wearing a yarmulke. I was like, that's done. You know, I looked at my tough nephews, you know, on the sub, but you don't put your yarmulke in your pocket. No one's going to say anything in New York. A, and if they do, you punch them in the face. This like, was your, your op-ed. Yeah, yeah. I wrote that after, after an op-ed after Charlottesville. Yeah. You know, my uh, uh, family, you know, like back to the mom that I mentioned, like, don't be political. I was like, you could take a stand against Nazis. It's one thing I'm pretty clear on. I don't like a Nazi. Anyway, but uh, but yes, after Charlottesville, I wrote an op-ed about this changed time. And I just feel like, again, watching the internet break down society just obsessed me. And I wondered what happened when we put religion through the machine. You know, this is a book about, uh, it's called Kaddish.com. And it's about, um, 
for those of you, is there anyone who doesn't know this watching? If so, welcome. Um, but the point is, yes, you have to say when someone dies, the Kaddish needs to be said, the prayer for the, the dead, it needs to be said in a quorum with a minion, it needs to be said multiple times a day, you know, in three minyanim and multiple times in each of those. So if you're not a religious person, I wanted to look at a Jewish family and I could think of no greater tension in a family than that. Because if you are religious, if you are a deeply faithful person and someone's not saying the Kaddish, literally like daddy is burning in hellfire, like for real, you cannot miss. And if you're not a religious person, you can't ask someone who's sort of religious to commit to never, it's hard enough to get to the gym, but to get to show three times a day. So it is a very ancient practice. I like what I, one thing I truly love about Judaism is it's so, so, so strict, but it, it makes things like, this is what you have to do to get married. You need to do this and you need to do that. And you need to have, you know, whatever you need to go to the mikvah. You don't want to go to the mikvah. Okay. You have to get a ring. Okay. You don't want to get a ring. Okay. Just have sex. You're married. You know, like <laughs> we start, we ask for the most and then we back up. So like you have, you have to say, like, okay, you don't want to say it. Someone else can say it for you. It's literally the same. It's not lesser. It is literally the same. You are covered. So I was thinking about putting it in the machine. And if you go to the site, Kaddish.com, it wasn't there. The person read the book who wouldn't sell me the site. And then it was like, I will make this real. So maybe I'll get to heaven from that. <laughs> but I got a call from a journalist like six or seven months. Wait, so Kaddish.com now is a, is a site. Yes. Now you can actually, not, yeah, from the book. Huh. I tried to, when I had the idea, I, I always, every other title I've ever written on any story or every book I pull it from, I find them inside the work. This was the first time I got an idea. I was like, it's going to be called Kaddish.com. And I didn't want it to be Kaddish.net or Kaddish.edu. <laughs> so I just, I was like, Very different. I was like this, yeah. yes, back to my superstitious religious self. I'm like, if there's something there, I'll write a different novel. But there was nothing there. But I, I tried to buy it. The publisher tried to buy it. But yes, they, <laughs> but it is now, it's gone live. I get, you know, I don't get to. <laughs> I don't get to make any money off your morning, but nonetheless, but um, yeah, so I really wanted to look at the way like human interaction falls apart in the machine. It's why I hate, I'm a delicate flower. I'm like, I don't know if when they talk about like Facebook hiding the Instagram, how unhealthy it is for teenage girls and one 52 year old Jewish man currently in Toronto, but like it's toxic to me, but the way people talk to each other, you know, it, it's helped people train being horrible, but there's actual people on the other side I trust my books on my family. There's some filthy parts in the book. There's some pornographic references. And my sister's like, I, I, you know, it's dedicated to her. And I said, you know, she's very religious. I said, I cannot dedicate it. To, she read it. She's like, can you take out the filthy parts? I said, no, but that was part of it. I was very interested hmm. in that notion. Like even that idea, the filthy thing, there's someone doing that job. They clock in, they clock out, they go home, you know, probably have a double, you know what I'm saying? Hmm. So I was just saying, we break down, you know, I'm even just interested, at, like on late night TV where they show someone, you're looking at your phone and you fall into a pond in the mall and they show that. I was like, this is the most famous thing this person's going to do and their children and their children's children. Like the idea that we just laugh at people falling down now, I'm, I promise you I'm mean spirited except when it comes to literature. So I don't want to misrepresent. But yes, I wanted to look at how we interact personally and religiously through the machine. And having grown up so religious, I think if there was the internet... Well, actually, if uh, this is the honest truth, if the Oreos were kosher, I would have been religious, but they're kosher now. I was like, I could have stayed kosher. But uh, a high. You were born too soon. Yes, exactly. A hydro, with great respects to the Hydrox, an Oreo <laughs> is an extremely delicious cookie. But um, when they would tell us God is omniscient, like this idea knows where, and I think that's in, like, as a questioning, you know, 13 year old who'd get thrown out of the room all the time, Englander, get out. You know, I won't tell the, you know, the rush to show. I won't tell the principal where you are. Just get lost, you know, get thrown out for every question. But the idea of omniscience that seemed not a feasible, that this God thing must be made up because the idea of knowing what each of us are doing, what everyone on the planet, to know everything you're doing now, what you're doing then and what you're doing in the future, that idea of that kind of power it's, it seemed impossible to me, but we basically built it. Like, it's not a joke. Like I was just things that I'm thinking about. I open Instagram and it's there, not in a little bit, like, not like I'm super, I'm in Canada now. I love, I've become obsessed with ice skating. I played my first game of shinny. That's pickup hockey. I got an assist. Anyway, I didn't break anything. That's the most important part. But anyway, but it's not like, I think I want skates and there's something about sports in my, it's like, I'm thinking in my head, I'll think Bauer skates and I'll, and there'll be an ad. Mm. So it, it does know it is Creepy. predictive. Yeah. So I was like, 
we have, it's a beta God. And that's when I thought about the book is like, we really have built a beta God and, and back to the title of this, which, which is, I don't know where my head's going. I didn't know each book ends up being the prep for the next book. So I'm writing, you know, about the Israel Palestine. And it's really about this idea of the machine and faith and, you know, Israel and prayer and all these things or Jerusalem. It's a Jerusalem book, not an Israel book. An Israel book needed a Jerusalem book, but, um, but I, I got very interested as like, oh, we built the monster. You know what I'm saying? Like it used to be, you're a Nazi. You got to sort of feel someone out on the train and being like, hey, I'm a Nazi, <laughs> you know, like, but now you can find everyone on the internet. It's really easy to be like, you know what I'm saying? I like, you know, popping balloons. And then there's 50 million people who, like, so I feel like we've unleashed a monster and it's really, it's made me think it's a time for like the ancient monsters are back in digital form. Like, I can't believe it. I drove on College Street, which is a street here. Um, I can translate everything for, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> for Bay Street, but, yeah, yeah. Bay Street, it's Wall Street. <laughs> anyway, I'm learning it all in my head. But I drove by a swastika the other day, you know what I'm saying, where we have our, you know, the, our protest, which is uh, people really you know, don't really understand how the Holocaust works. But like this notion of people in yellow, like the idea that I was going to see people mark, like the number of swastikas I see or, you know, you know, we just watched these protests, Confederate flags. Um, the Civil War was not in Canada, but um, maybe the next one will spread. But nonetheless, yes, the idea of what's back has made me think we may, you know, I was talking uh, to a, a friend about this, but um, really that maybe uh, if the ancient, you know, we may need the ancient heroes to fight the ancient monsters, but it may be in digital form. So, so yes. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking um, about uh you know, bringing up swastikas and ancient monsters and such. Um, the, the people were very captivated when the story broke about um, the cold case who might have betrayed the okay. Frank family, right? And the idea that it might be, the suggestion that it might be a Jewish person really struck a chord. You know, this idea that there's something particularly monstrous in the eyes of the broad yes. public about that. And I was sort of thinking about your um, the title story of your collection, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, the way in which that sense of who would betray you, who would rescue you um, is so central to it. And I'm kind of wondering whether there's something monstrous about betrayal and something redemptive about rescuers and, and how you see that playing out now. Oh, that is, uh, yes. I'll just keep these are it's so nice to be using my brain again it's really lovely um i have littles i was joking with a writer friend the other night they're like one friend's handed in a book another one's halfway through a book i was like were we supposed to have been writing during this <laughs> i had no idea i've just been home in my pajamas but um that is so so giant and there's so many uh academics here i'm going to ask you to let me sign up for a phd after because i really do want to learn all this stuff so maybe you can help me unpack it but you know again i you know i i talk to you. I uh, know you both off camera. So the idea of Jews as race, as culture, like all these very ancient things and how they manifest now, it's a really confusing thing. Like I've super identified, I know I'm a white man, but I identify, I've always identified as Jewish. It's only in this moment where like, or when I check off on a form where I have to put, I, I was like, it really always confuses me. I was like, there's no Jew, but I don't want there to be a Jew. Dave mm -hmm. and I were talking about this, but I, I've never felt you know, sort of like the Whoopi Goldberg thing where I'm like, well, you know, where like the Holocaust wasn't because Jews were, you know, they were, I was like, there's a thing called Aryans. Anyway, we can, we don't have to unpack all of that. So to your point, and I've really been thinking about that story because I've adapted it into a play, which was postponed because of COVID. So I'm really into it. So first of all, I'm very interested. This is an uncooked idea, but it's really with me and of how we play our own parts in life where I think like, you know, you watch the Olympics and I'm like, why is everybody objectively and subjectively gorgeous? Like, why is the quarterback gorgeous? <laughs> it's like, because those are the kids that get the extra push. You know, those are the ones they're like two kids do a gorgeous, you know, trick on their skis. And they're like, but yours looks better, you know, and that's so I'm very I wonder how much my writing got like clapped at in grad school. You know, I remember people being you know, frustrated with certain kind of work. And I went away angry the first summer to be like, is this the kind of story you want? And everyone was like, yes, this is the one we want. And here's your career. You know, but it's like if Steingart and I are doing an event, we'll be like, I already made a mom joke, but I'll be like, I know to be like, I'm so anxious. How's my cholesterol? Like, you know, this, the expectation of that, of what Jews take on. And I feel like it's, 
you know, those easy prejudices where you say Jews are smart, like if you accept that, then other things come with it. So to this point, I don't even know why that's a fascination of like, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at like Trump running is, you know, presidency. And by the way, I like that I'm like a trained American. Like, is this political? I was like, he, he did have a, a hey, it's attempted Canada. coup. It's yeah, Canada. yeah, exactly. Okay. I know moving here and everyone's like, I was like, oh, all the neighbors think he's, you know, <laughs> but it, they'll be like, oh, his, you know, Michael Cohen is Jewish. I was like, he's running the show. You know, like this idea where Jews, like you, I do feel, I know I'm obsessed with Jews, but I feel like other people, I'm watching with Ukraine and everyone's like, he's, like the Jews are trying to let people know he's a brave Jewish leader. I was like, are we supposed to be cowards? You know what I'm saying? So I feel like it's from a point of pride to be like, look at this super badass dude is like, I'm going to die here with my flak jacket on. Mm -hmm. If that's what it comes to, like, you know, again, nothing. It's brave to die. It's braver when you say I'm number one on the list and my family's number two. That puts tears in my eyes. That's real bravery. Mm -hmm. You know, that's true. But that idea, this notion to feel to add that. So. I find it so absurd. First of all, it's not proven that this is that they were turned in by Jews, but like it's the fucking Holocaust. Like the not, you know, like yeah. the Jewish neighbors didn't kill Anne Frank. You know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if she was so sad that she hung herself, you know, in a camp. She did, you know what I'm saying? Every death is on the killers. And I find it a very strange notion. I have a lot of childhood memories of stories that we would, I mean, absurd stuff that I don't even want to say here that was about us taking the weight of everything. Like Hitler was this way. We had a million urban legends that would all adjust to like make it. I feel like it's really, so to me, this is non-controversial. The, you know, the book is either accurate or it's not, not accurate, but either way it is moot because no one killed the Jews of Holland, but the Nazis, like that's it, you know? I love uh, my favorite, like an excellent, excellent, excellent Holocaust novel is um, Leslie Epstein's King of the Jews, because it's about, it's uh, the Lodge Ghetto and Rumkowski, this idea of I love ethics and justice, which is, so they're killing all the Jews. If, a, if somebody wants to save their Jews, like people worked with the Nazis, to try, they're killing all the Jews. Maybe you can save your Jews. Like, is that, Heroic, you know, Katzner, uh, we have Hungarians on premises. Katzner, they killed when he got to Israel as a traitor. You know, he was assassinated. There's there's academics here, the big, no, he wasn't. He's alive and well in Etobicoke. Anyway, I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Anyway, but um, but like Ram Kat, he wrote this book about the, you know, ethical challenges of the Lodge Ghetto. And he's like, the Nazis, we can't look at the culture. They cloud everything. He wrote this whole book about Jews interacting the Holocaust without saying the word Nazis once, which I think is, masterful mm -hmm. like there is we can look at a community but there is you know there's only one person so i think to you blame. know in a way that's a way a way of talking about how it is that a writer or the literary imagination can bring something to a conversation about history uh you know i have no i i watch other writer friends another thing i measure is like seems to be really good to be really aggressive, but I don't know how to do that i just know how to be suffering so i won't answer that as a confident writer because i only uh play that on zoom but um as a reader yes a hundred percent i don't think there's anything that i'm just a believer that repatterns your brain that way that explores idea and that's the point when anything like this happens you see a hundred books there you're like you know by the way the only people i don't credit are the you know when anything happens in history you see someone's already written a novel about it because if you dream it enough i don't take compliments well i appreciate them so please give more of them, but I don't really process them. The only thing as a writer that I look for is when people say, how do you know? You know, when I get to meet someone who lived under Stalin, you know, who read a story of mine and be like, like mm -hmm. that, someone in Argentina, that's what I'm looking for. That's the tuning fork is that it should be real. So yes, the predictive nature of novels is because it, it's, you can really, I do believe if you sit and just think that you can really dream a future, the only people I don't credit or everyone who got credit, they're like, this predicts the pandemic. I was like, if you knew it was coming, you should have stopped writing the novel and told us. So I would have bought a 95s. But otherwise, all the other novels that predict history, it's fascinating. But yes, people write beautiful pandemic books and that's how it is. And back to the Anne Frank thing, we've seen it, we see it with immigrants. You know, now we have all these people, uh, you know, in the States who uh, seem to loathe immigrants and want to build walls and fences. And then they're like, the Poland's welcome, they're cheering on Poland. I was like, that's called welcoming people in dire straits. But even this is the, the 
people really are nice in Canada. You can't believe it. It's really true. I think so. People tell me this Toronto, like this is the mean city. I'm like, I don't know what the nice city is like. <laughs> but, but back to like Anne Frank stuff during the start of COVID, like our heat went out. We knew we had a, you know, my two-year-old was a baby baby. I had two kids, like heat going out like in a winter in Canada is no joke. And it was the height, like those first week of COVID when it happened, we didn't know what the fuck was happening. Sorry that I keep cursing, but it's just here. Anyway, but um, you can bleep just it us. in replays. But, um, <laughs> but um, oh, like two neighbors that we hardly knew. We were new people in town. Like we you know, just moved from my wife's job. We have a baby, no heat. And two different neighbors who are nervous as can be said, you'll all stay with us tonight. Like, it, it, you know, we got it going in the 24 hour people came and got us hooked up. But like, that was so deeply moving to me. I was like, that's the thing. Like, what do you do? We were, we didn't know if we're all going to die from this thing. And these are people also with kids and to say, you'll stay in our house. I said, like, people make instant choices that are brave. Like at the start of COVID, thank God, we don't have to be that kind of scared. But that was I, you know, bring people in with your kids, like at the first weeks, like that's scary. And I just both sides of us, you'll stay with us till you till you're you have heat again. And I, I want to like, stick. Up, I, want, I want to pick up on this this Canada thing. I mean, narcissistic question for us Canadians, for me Canadian to yes. ask. But the well, New Yorker should be on one seat. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I, when I'm, I'm not sure if this happens to either of you when you guys read novels, but when I, as a reader of novels, uh, especially ones that are you know, deeply character driven. I often wonder how I would be depicted if I was a character in another in another novel. And when I read, I see myself and I see my friends and I see my families, family members in the characters that I read. Um, and so there's this sort of secret wish that I harbor to be like, what, what would I look like as the subject? It's like reading your psychoanalyst yeah. notes about yourself, yeah. but maybe less scary or maybe more scary. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, um, and so a lot of us Canadians read your piece in, I guess, right when you 2002 in the fall, 2000, 2020 in the, in the Globe and Mail about having moved to Toronto with your, your wife, a fellow York professor. Hello, if you're out there, Professor Silver. Um, uh, and so I, I wanted to know, and, and I, well, we also know that you've been writing about Montreal a little bit. Um, so I wanted if you could tell us about being an American in Canada, or particularly about being an American Jew in Jewish Canada, uh, and what you've what you've noticed. What... Um, uh, I, um, I've noticed a lot of Jews in Canada. In my I, I say, <laughs> wherever I travel the world, I don't know if this is the week to fly to Moscow, but like I get off the plane and they take me, and suddenly I I'm drinking whiskey, and there's you know Hasidim all around. You know like. The whole world, I, I thought I was very worldly the way I traveled. Then I recognized I get off the plane and they take me to Jews, but I seem to have done it again. But uh, there's a, you know, a lot of mezuzahs in my neighborhood. But yes, I, I didn't know how Jewish, like in a New York way. I thought it's like New York, Jerusalem, like slivers of Paris. You know, like I didn't know there was a, you know, maybe Golders Green. I didn't know. Yes, that's, uh, it is a very, there are some very Jewish spots in Toronto. There's some good challah um, and a Harvard Bakery shout out, not kosher. But no anyway um but yeah it's uh i see i guess i learned this when i went to jerusalem is like i like being an expat it serves me i don't think you can see anything i i still remember this when i started writing or started to meet a community of writers the people who could like sit like this and then write this story the next day like if i write this scene it'll be like 14 years from now like I absorb and so you know that's why 20 years after Intifada 2 after the peace process that's when I'm ready that's when I feel like I have the distance from Jerusalem so I only wrote about New York and Jerusalem and Jerusalem and New York and it's like things like that you know I went so to Argentina. We have a Canadian book to look forward to in 20 years. I, I and I you might hope. be in it. I should hope <laughs> exactly once I get the notes from your analyst. I didn't, I didn't, but, discover, um, yeah. I didn't discover that I was Canadian until I yeah. lived in Jerusalem. Yeah. But, that's fu- uh, but that's it. No that's idea. funny. That's when I discovered I was American. I no I but that's that a Jewish Canadian. thing. I was always a Jew in New York, even though my family's been there for so long. But I just always felt a Jew, maybe because a lot of people were screaming at me when I was little. But nonetheless, but yes, <laughs> at home I was. But yes, I just I, that's the identity. But that's it. And it, in Israel, I became an American. You know, but um, I just love that idea that it's. Uh, I love when everything's new that you have to relearn everything. Right. I just love that you have to get a driver's license again, all that stuff and the cultural differences. You know, we had this, you know, uh, um, by the way, 
90 percent of Canadian truckers more are, uh, have their vaccine. You know, this idea that the Internet blows things up. We have a few people, you know, as I said, it really is nice here and sensible. And, you know, that notion where people like it's my right and like it's your right in America. Like I like that here. What's what's it called? I don't even know what the Declaration of Independence. What's it called? Here? Constitution. The Constitution. What do you call it here? The Charter of Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But yeah, it's like um, you know, it's basically tort law. You can swing your arms, but when it hits your neighbor's face, you have to stop. And I felt like that idea. I was going to take pictures for friends here. I was at a rural gas station. Like when you get to a rural gas station in the states, you're like, I'd rather have COVID than wear my mask in there. And I was right. like, Oh my god! Like everyone's wearing a mask. The guy, but that certain cultural ideas. Strangely are, conservative and liberal. I have never seen a country. I hope this isn't a crazy thing today, but I'll find uh, to say. But um, I've never seen a country without an active enemy that recognizes its relationship to each other. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like certain things I'd see traveling around in certain places, but it's the idea where they feel really surrounded. So then they feel certain rules for a neighbor. So, you know, people be like, you know, Israel, you know, Palestinians occupation, this, that war is like all it's fierce politics, but you like pop a tire, like 10 cars are going to stop. But I, I feel a real sense of responsibility to, you know, just shock, you know, at how we let people die over insulin, you know, in the States, like, shouldn't a person who needs insulin get it? Like, it's not a question here. And I find those things are for real and sharper here. It's just, it is different to maneuver, like, uh, assumptions of what's, you know, part of being a writer, you write alone forever, then occasionally you put a jacket on and schmooze, like even understanding how politics move or how people, it is, uh, it is an endless education. And, and I love how different it is. You know, I knew it would be different, but it's even more different than I thought. So I'm kind of thinking just from what you said about the immigrant experience. I mean, in coming yes. to Canada, although, I mean, my experience when I came here and we both come from New York, and in fact, we both come from Long Island. So Long that's a real Island, uh, yeah, exactly. Long Island and Jewish signs. day schools in yes, Long Island. Exactly. But and I also spent hours in my principal's office for yes. these theological yes. questions. But oh, mercy upon us. Exactly. But but coming here. I mean, really coming as an immigrant, I, I remember when I came, I thought same language really feels the same on the surface. But then I realized it is a different culture and it really is the immigrant experience. I'm wondering not, not only how you felt about that personally, but you know, it used to be a cliche um, in pe for people who study Jewish American literature that, um, the generation of immigrant writers and their children, they got the charge in their writing from being immigrants. Do you feel like somehow coming here and being an immigrant is a substantive enough experience to kind of find its way into your writings? Does it make you think oh, uh, about what uh, home is and, and yes. belonging and inside or outside? But, you know, uh, but when you talk about that, you know, uh, <coughs> a thousand things, and I do think uh, I do think this is why Canadians do really well in the States that are, you know, if they're whatever they want to be, whether you want to be like Lauren Michaels or whatever, you know, just, I think it's that kind of disruption where you speak the language, you have all the cultural references, but you're not every, when you see things in, in that manner, you can see, you know, just things that are invisible to other people. I think it really helps in that direction, but yeah, hundred percent. I, I just, distance helps you reflect. I mean, who knows even what's going to happen just a year. And I, I feel hungry. This is a separate matter, but we all have different things, but having littles in a pandemic and a, having just moved and not having, you know, coverage or schools. And I think, oh, I was talking, uh, Stephen Marsh, the, uh, lives, you know, he, um, the writer who's also, uh, uh, a Shakespeare expert, but he, he said to me, he's like, we've had the longest lockdown. And I was like, yeah, he's like, no, not North America. He's like in recorded his history. He's <laughs> like more than the black death, like Toronto has been locked down more than any place in the whole history of recorded history, you know? So we have been so locked down, but I think even being, being forced to change always renews me. But this idea, I have never, if you're a writer, part of it is the compulsion. I always say like it's addiction versus compulsion. And a lot of writers are also, uh, you know, tend towards both, but like that compulsive need, you know, where you have to balance it out. Like I like to raise my kids or I like to have a social life. You know, I, I know people who don't need either, you know, things like that. But um, I've never, there has been nothing that stopped me like where it was not a viable, where I wouldn't find my writing time. You know, I tell my students, 
don't accept a FedEx package. You think I'm going to get interrupted because <laughs> like, let someone else get your package. No, I won't help you. You know, I'll pay I mean, for except your... the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. But the pandemic, yeah. I'm saying with yeah. little, with a baby, like right. all that, with two kids and home and like, you can't be up all day and all night and not, you know, we had a great time. I'm so thankful for the bonding, but I, I feel separately, everything for writing is good for writing if you want to find it if you want to make it good. And I even think that idea of, I've already mapped out where I'll be like, Louise Glick, Wild Iris. She like did, it wasn't writing 10 weeks looking at her garden, beautiful book of poetry, you know, Jesus' son, like Dennis Johnson needed cash to pay the IRS, to pave a road. Like I, I'm already mapping out the people who like had to write fast, write quick. I love these lists, but yes, I think I am so lit up by this new place. Like, as you said, I've been writing S. I've never written. That's what I could do during the pandemic. I've always wanted to learn to write the personal essay. So I was like, I can do that in fits and starts. I, can, I remember Liz Rosenberg, a professor at Binghamton, who writes children's books, but she was saying she wrote her children's book because she's like, you can walk around in the night like with a baby and remember, you can't remember your novel. <laughs> she's like, but I can remember a rhyme. So that's why I was like, what can I do? And that's why I started to teach myself the personal essay. But yes, I am lit up by learning this community and by like being held back behind the gate. I am, it reminds me of when I, I am giddy, like when I dreamed of being a writer, like, you know, it never, I did an event recently with Zadie Smith. We both teach at NYU when we were saying how like things change. We're not, you know, gymnasts, like a gymnast at 52, you're done. There's no, I always say not enough cortisone shots, but for writers, you keep your marbles, but it shifts. Like, you know, this hunger goes there, that times go, you know, you start a story on draft 300 instead of draft one. So if I always take 500 drafts, now I need 200. But I, I, it's so something about being pulled away from my desk as, as in, in a new place, I really feel like back in Jerusalem starting to write. New place, time to work, I am just ready to go. I like well, thinking of Toronto tell- as Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah. The, yes, the, exactly. The middle. I'll, I'll be I'll, Ronald I'll Reagan. It's, the, the, it's the, the city on a hill. You know. City on a plane. Yes. Right in city the on a plane. Yes. <laughs> Montreal's <laughs> the city on a hill. Um, I learned that on my trip. Montreal. It's, it's Mount Royal. Mount Royal. Yes. Um, tell us about uh, about your forays into theater writing. Speaking of changing up new genres, nonfiction, oh. personal essays, short stories, novels, and now we understand. You just said. Yeah. yeah. It's so a particularly I, I, interesting time to be thinking about theater. And I people. just, I, so yeah, I had one play 10 years ago that my story, The 27th Man, when the first book came out, uh, I got a call saying like, Nora Efron wants to have lunch. And she took me to Barney Greengrass because um, she's like, nice. I wanted to use my, my mm. Jewish cred. She <laughs> told me much later, but she saw this story, which is uh, about um, Stalin I owe a lot of, you know, you can really track sometimes your, your moments in your career, but um, a, a friend is here, but like when these moments of research where you find a thing that's just so exciting, but I was taking a different class on the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, uh, and the teacher mentioned, you know, this is again, uh, to very much date myself though I'd scream at age four times, I'll tell you my weight later. But um, it was, I don't know, I, I don't remember which week it, the, this, the wall was, the Berlin wall was gonna come down that semester. I don't, I think it wasn't down yet, but she had just said how Stalin it was had like killed- late February. Yes, exactly. She had said that, you know, just, you know, apropos, I don't know why it came up, but that Stalin had killed all these writers, like the, the United of the Murder Poets. And then really so few people know about it. There weren't, you know, archives, like anything there's, a, you know, so um, I just, that's why I became, that's when I decided to, years later, because of that, I decided to become a writer because I thought these writers were murdered, these Jewish writers with the greatest stories of their lives to tell, and they didn't get to tell it. I was like, they deserve this is a good, they would like to tell this story over dinner. And I thought a real writer should write it. For, and I, I was like, how is no real writer doing it for them? And when no one did, I was like, I guess I better give it a try anyway. But it was four writers, you know, three famous and one unknown in a, in a cell. And she was like, this is a play. And I, I feel like I thought about that too. But when you don't come from fancy, you know, or just, you know, when like I watch like Steven Spielberg's sister, like he always had that camera. You know, you can always get a pencil pretty much anywhere in the world. You get a pencil and a piece of paper. Like I, I had kind of thought about maybe it should be a play and put that away because I don't know actors. That's that's a fancy person thing. I thought to be a playwright and a director. Anyway, so we really she developed that with me for like a decade, and that happened. And and I just got the bug because I love 
passionate people. That's why I like my doctor friends, you know, like both medical doctors, academic doctors. I just love someone to be like, I'm interested. We're talking about our friend Scott, you know, you're going to be like, who was Miss Afula in 1920? You know, people have these <laughs> obsessions, you know, and filled with these every possible fact that you could know, you know, so, um, but anyway, when I got to the play world, I loved meeting compulsive. Like I wept the first time I met the costumer, like she had researched my characters in the, in the play you know, thought what the set looked like, how their outfits met the set, the people that she thought I'd base them on and found everything they'd worn through their careers, you know, under Stalin and made board, like that idea I rewrote, I put in a, you know, uh, a medal. Anyway, I actually rewrote lines based on a costuming meeting, but to meet these people who are so dedicated, who will sit in the dark with you 12 hours, it just was life-changing. Also, I don't get to read my work with you. I always say, please come to readings. We need people at readings. But going to a reading is sort of hearing, it's like meet the writer day. Like when you go to see a musician, they play their music. You know, when you go to an art show, they're like, here's my art. But a book thing, you're like, here I am, take the book home. Right. Like, <laughs> it's the, true. The play is the, it was the first time I got to sit and see my people. Like I tried to make them alive in the story, but to see the actors, this one, uh, at, um, actor was so sad that I, I caught him in the dressing room. He was almost in tears and every, he felt bad that everyone would get mad at him every night. It hurt like that. The membrane was, was there was, it was astonishing to me. So yes. Uh, when, when I, when the Lincoln center commissioned this play and it's opening with Barry Edelstein at the old globe in San Diego, who, who directed my play at the public and there. And, and, and yes, it, the, what we talk about Anne Frank's story is it's, you know, who would hide you in the event of a second Holocaust, which back to this strange moment, I was raised always with this notion that we just talked about as if the second Holocaust was always looming, like it could happen at any time, which also much like the omniscience thing that we started this talk mm -hmm. with always seems stupid to me till you're like, or not so stupid, like the world can flip in a second. Or a war can just break out. Yeah, a war could just break out, these kind of things. And, you know, back to your place, this is uh, Holocaust heavy, even for me, but I remember visiting Auschwitz and like, I could, the guy's frame thing from Chicago, people go home to visit their family. Like you see people now, they're just in Ukraine, you know, a soccer team, you know, just how a moment, a flight can put you anywhere. Anyway, it's four people in a room and the transfer in answer to your question of 72 minutes ago, the idea that play changes, I find it beautiful that every form makes its own demands. And I literally had to rewrite the ending to the, it is the, it, the spirit. It's like translation. I've done some translation language stories have spirits. So when it goes, I, I wish I could read, you know, Gogol in Russian. I wish I could read this, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know what it's like, you know, I'm going to start naming novels like, you know, Voltaire, like it's funny. You know, that's why I love crossing time and space. Candide makes me laugh. It's funny to me not speaking French like hundreds of years later. So, but even one's own work sitting with it, the idea of taking them out of the page and putting them on the stage, they be, everybody morphs. It becomes a whole different experience and you get to the same, I, I don't, uh, I don't want to make any claims. You only know if a play works after you see it, but I'm saying you, a story finds it's this, that's why I don't want to claim, make any claims to truth, which is uh, very in short supply now. So I better not take any extra truth. The story finds its own truth and the play has to find a different one. And that to me is worth, you know, spending. I've been working on it for years, just for a few weeks. I love the people coming together. One actor who, uh, uh, um, He'll be in her, but Josh, it's very sweet to be like, you know, just jokingly, like, have I aged out of it? Have I, you know, he writes me every few weeks, like, as the play goes, I'm like, you're still perfect <laughs> dad age. You remain. But like, I love this idea of people committed to being these other people. It's also real people. trust. I mean, you're entrusting them to uh, sort of take your your impulse and your passion and and give it a life that's maybe a little bit different. I, I, I may be a monster on a thousand fronts. It's not for anyone. But uh I really just respect brains. I love the idea. Uh, I think other playwrights might not do this. I know from the last time, because if somebody would come out and just riff and say something funnier, I'd be like, that's in the play. And they'd be like, what? I'd be like, well, your line's funnier mm -hmm. than mine. The best line wins. And I was like, I think some playwrights are, you know, I know David Mamet's very much like, you don't, you just read what's on the page or so the articles or his own interviews, you know, say about that stuff. Well, but he writes an iambic pentameter. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know. But I just, I love, it is, we did a rehearsal in New York right before 
you know, the pandemic. And I wish we could do this for novels. I know some novelists who bother a lot more people than I do, but um, <laughs> but to have people read it, it's 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 transformative. That also, I consider that another draft. Like whichever person, like I see why they have a list of the original cast in a play always because whatever person rehearses the first part, it's going to get rewritten for them. It just, they bring themselves to it and it just becomes another thing. So yes, I can't wait to get in the room with all these people. Also, I can't believe that counts as work. I'm like, is this a day's work? And they give you breaks by law. They're like, we have to have a sandwich now. <laughs> it's really funny. You can be mid sentence. They're like, break. And food, how Jewish. Yeah, exactly. This is the pause. Everyone take a shot at home. This is, yeah, yeah, so I'm wondering, do you want to talk a little bit about memory? I'm really struck at how important memory is in, in the works of yours that, that I've read. I mean, you know, you have Kaddish.com, which of course is about ritualized memory. Yeah. And uh, you have a stories uh, about Israel-Palestine. You have a story about um, uh, set in, you know, among the disappeared in South America. Yes. Um, memory seems so central. You even have a character called Kaddish. yes. So, oh, so the character called Kaddish, I have uh, different characters named like that. I'm obsessed with the Jewish idea. I love the idea of tricking the angel of death, you know? So that's the idea. If, if you'll literally meet someone that you knew, if like a person, you know, has a heart attack and you see them at, you know, at Chill, you feel like, you'll be like, hey, David, you'll be like, I'm Phil now. And I'll be like, okay, you know, but you literally change your name because they've got a, the right. angel of death had the list. So I love that idea of, you know, these little things. I have a story called sister Hills where people would literally sell their child for like a dollar to a neighbor, a sick child, because like this child's worth. I'm selling this child. For, it's not my kid. If you're, if, if you're coming for my kid, it's not my kid anymore. Or like who wants this, you know, I love this notion of, of names as ways to trick the angel of death or to reinvent or things like that. But memory, I think because, I see how my own memory has been shaped in form. It's both my memory, but it is an absolute construct. I still don't believe in evolution. I don't. I know to logically believe in it. I, yes, I, idea wise, I believe in it, but you can't unpattern. I was such a serious kid and they taught us so hard. And I learned like it's six days of creation for me. You know, like it, you know, I under, I obviously mm. believe the other one, but I'm saying my brain is, patterned. And I think that idea, I think it comes why I wrote the Anne Frank story that you asked about is because my sister and I always as shorthand, I didn't notice this till my 40s. Or I, like, when I came up with that story that because it just seemed normal to me, if we'd meet someone and be like, you know, she's nice, my sister and I'd be like, would she hide us in the hol mm -hmm. second Holocaust? Would she make space? And we'd be like, nah, we're like, we don't trust her. That's our trust thing. So how did, you know, I've said this for 20 something years, the only accents I ever heard from relatives were Boston accents, like Masha, put the car in the garage, you know, like, like that's it. So how did super American kids, the children of Americans who were the children of Americans who were the children of Americans, you know, like mm -hmm. who were the children of people, like how did I get raised? My wife makes fun of me every day like what time of day I mentioned Hitler, the Holocaust, right? Like, oh, 1045, you said Birkenau. You know, like <laughs> that someone, your reality is, you know, back to also cottage.com to this book, to the internet, to people being exposed to ideas, you know, where you can have someone, you know, denazify a Jew. Like it's, you know, that that you can train brains to see whatever it works. Like America's I, I, I believe in my country and I think it's savable. We've been through so much, but you have people who believe untruths. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't think it would work with footage. You know what I'm saying? I didn't think you could watch like January 6th, watch it on TV 24 hours a day and then be like, it didn't happen. But that's, I mean, that is some straight. So yes, I'm both interested in memory and I don't think I've ever said this out. Like, I don't tell anyone this, but even, I don't know if any of you have this. I used to have recurring dreams when I was little or stuff like that, but I have certain, a couple of memories that I'm not sure they were so vivid. I'm not sure if they were dreams or memories. So I'm very interested in how we make our own truths or even back to that essay of like something that was screamed at me and my sister. And I put in that essay and fact checked it for the time, whatever. But I remember a bicycle. She remembers a car. It doesn't change what was said. It doesn't, we both remember the same thing. We, the same words verbatim. But that idea that we can change mm -hmm. motion, like 
I'm very interested in how the brain patterns and how reality forms, you know, back to, you know, our prisons filled with people who just say like, that's the guy. Well, I don't trust you to pick the guy of that lineup of young black men after your trauma. Like we have imprisoned, you know, off a thing that do memory does not work in trauma that way. You know what I'm saying? Like, and this idea that we had, a, we have a penal system based on something that's like in a flash in, in trauma, you know, it's, it's just shocking to me how we're watching again, your memory of the past makes, makes the future. Like this idea I'm reading about, you know, I'm reading about czars in the newspaper as relevant to today's news, like people's understanding. But you know what? Anyone who read the paper today and say, wait, Russia's, you know, tied, you know, this, their politics is tied to memories of the czars. Like you never grew up religious. Like, you know, I remember a super religious, a friend, you know, her, like sort of like me, she's like less religious than this brother's Hasidic. But she said, where Israelis are saying to the Palestinians, they wear the keys around their neck. You know, those, someone will say dead serious. You wear the key to your house, that's gone. And I was like, and then she said, we waited for this house's 2000 years. You want them to throw out the key after 50? Right. You know, like this idea of like, m most of my basic beliefs are ancient. You know what I'm saying? Like I wasn't a sports guy, like Moses is a main character for me. Abraham, you know, like even these, back to me not believing in, in evolution, the English names aren't real to me either. I know <laughs> Avram, Moshe, like I'm saying, they, like ancient history is my current history. So, uh, you know, so yeah. this really touches on a thread that David and I were both interested in. And we, I think we only have a little bit of time before we'll open it up to questions and answers. But, um, you know, in addition to your novels, you translated, you did a translation of the Haggadah, and we were interested in what it means to be a secular Jew to you. Yeah, I mean, that's, I didn't know that was a thing growing. I mean, uh, again, I can bring my family on, pull them off the side, like, this is your life. Like, we often have this argument. They're like, but to be, Jew it's a religion, so that's to be religious. Like, it's even a, you know, like, what is that to be a secular Jew? I, I am, it's really back in my head now of what is Jewishness, you know, and I've been reading about it, and I'm very, you know, susceptible to whatever, reading different books about it. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Like, I talked to my friend, I was like, I want my kids to know everything and then reject it all. Like that's, I, I don't really know what to do. Yeah, I, you know? I think this comes up all the time when you're writing and you, you mentioned earlier this story that you wrote about the sold kid. You have actually a second story where this character, a heret in one of the stories in, you know, is, is traded. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And um, I was, she when I read about her and lots of other characters that you have that are, they're kind of off the derech characters. They're yes. characters that contravene the moral political expectations of whatever Jewish community they're in. So they leave their Orthodox communities or they spy on Israel or, you know, searing critiques of American Jewish sociability. Um, and when I read this Athera character, I thought of, I thought of Acher, the, the, the Tana from, you know, from the Gemara, this character yeah. who's, who's a heretic and who becomes known as the other. Um, and That's I was, I get, you're a ringer. I'm a ringer. <laughs> I was thinking, no, so he's, he's interpreted in all kinds of different ways, you know, yes. as a fallen hero, as a great, someone who makes the great effort to try to resolve tradition and modernity as an absolute heretic. You know, he's really, he's a Rorschach experiment for Jewish, you know, kind of for, for who, who Jews that, that, that buck the Jewish trend in their worlds. So I was thinking about being a kind of outsider or a critic, let's say an apichorus. Yes, uh, that's and, what I call myself. That's how I do it. Well, that's what I was you. Which is from Epicurean, which I love. Yeah, I exactly. Like food too. Even this is like someone who takes pleasure, uh, you know, but I, do you get criticized for this? Do you see this as the, the writer's role to be a kind of critic? Is there, is there that's the one for thing I'm, it? or I wouldn't say, and the one thing I'm sensitive about, but like I just, Find me, a you know, I watch the kids, you, you know, like where they're sort of stuck in the system where like, it's really hard to study 12 hours a day in Jerusalem. There's some kids who are stuck in there. Like not everybody's, I always say when parents are like, my kid wants to be a writer, what do I tell them? I said, tell them you'll pay for it and they should do it because no one's going to last six months in the room. It's, you know, it's <laughs> like, it's, if you don't want to write, it's miserable. That's why you want to get a PhD. Like you're like, go get it. Like, you're not going to make it through your pre, like if you don't want to do it, right. it'll become clear right quick. You know, so, um, yeah, so I, I guess I work so hard and I put, I, I do think it's a, I studied with Marilyn Robinson, like she's, you know, she's my rabbi, like I really do, it's a different, 
there's different heads. I think writing is a moral, like ethical act. I think you do have responsibilities to what you write. So for me, I put my whole heart and soul into it. So you can be mad. I learned this easy and it's a very interesting time now with creativity and what you're allowed to touch, what you're not allowed to touch. Like, it's very strange to have voices in your head. Oh, there's this uh, Rebecca Donner book I liked, but this uh, writer, um, I hope someone's playing Hitler bingo at home. Now your card is full. But um, <laughs> But uh, he was like really popular at the time, uh, you know, and then Hitler took over. He's like, okay, I want to be true to my leftiness, but Hitler kind of watches for this stuff. So I have to keep Hitler happy and be progressive. And then the next, it was like all one paragraph. He's like, and then he lost his mind and was institutionalized. And I was like, and there it is in one paragraph. But you need to, like, it got very clear to me early on when people were being like, how, you know, like my story, my story, The 27th Man about these murder writers was about the decision to write. I didn't want to set it in a mall on Long Island, so I said it there. But then some old, you know, Stalinist would come up to me and want to argue like this is mine. And I understood that is a sweet, sweet compliment. When people when people are taking ownership of your work, it means it means something to them. These ideas. But as a writer, I can tell you if it's in my head, I must own it. I didn't see you there. I work so hard for you. I dream of these things for years. I write them infinitely. The, like read it, don't read it. Like. I put my whole heart into it. So that that stuff's not confused. Everything is confusing to me in life, except that like I write and I really do think about the moral ethical part. So I just stand by all that. But on the secular thing, I think we might be at a transformative time. Like I am so I try to um, I get teased a lot back to that got a, you know, with Jonathan Sepin forward. He used to on stage. It was like vaudeville. Because I, you know, I would say to everybody, I'm an atheist, I'm totally secular. And then he'd have me read some of the translation. Every night he'd go, Have you ever seen a more religious man in your life? And everybody would laugh. So I, I think I think things might change of what it means to be a Jew, or like that might be happening in different ways right now, but like I won't live to see it or something. You know, I think about like heaven and hell. We didn't have, I'm really obsessed. Jews did not have heaven and hell. We had, I liked when we had Sheol and the Witch of Angel. We had witches, we had magic. Like, don't pretend we, we had, had, we had Z's. limbo. I just learned about Z's. You guys know Z's? No, like Z's. Z's is with Leviathan, Leviathan. Yeah. And uh, that's like the, that's the, the, the sea one. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. a land one. What's the land? Um, the land monster is Snuffleupagus. No, no, no. Like in the Gemara. Like no. Shohabar. No, well, that's uh, what they're eating in Paris. Well, and then there's Z's, which is like the the sky one. This like oh, nice. thing with like a wingspan that's big enough to like block out the sun. I will. I, just, I, I will pay for coffee. Jewish to monsters. This. On yeah. me. <laughs> Next coffee on me. But yeah, so I, I just think there are these moments of change where suddenly you have heaven and hell or suddenly it's matrilineal and then it's like, are we going to switch to now? There's so many, you know, if more than 50% of Jews are to marry, maybe we'll get back to like matrilineal or patrilineal, like globally, not just mm. certain streams. So yeah, I'm not sure. It feels really strong, you know, and it's been a couple of hundred years back to like, I always think of that now also. It was uh, the Germanic thing, be a Jew in your tent and a man mm -hmm. in the street. Like what a quote, but that's really clear to me now of what that means, you know, like that's code switching is what that is, you know, like ancient Jewish code switching. There's an essay, there's an academic essay. <laughs> Where do I put the hyphen? So yeah, I, I don't really, I just think I'm me. And I guess that's it. People used to ask me a lot, do I believe in God? And I was like, that doesn't torture me at all. So I think it's a really good question and I think it's hyper complex, but yeah, I, I don't know what I am. I just know I'm it. It's about raising the kids that you have to decide. Hmm. I just know when my daughter was saying hala, I was like, I better get her a huh real quick. Like, <laughs> hala, hala. Um, we're gonna move to our Yay. questions from the floor or from the from our you know our guests. That and let's are remind everyone soon. if you have a question, put it in the mm. question box. Oh, but before we do, I just want to take one opportunity to ask about what you're what you're thinking about writing next, and if you can share with us a little bit about that. Oh, um, back to, I wanted to, I, I love short stories so much and it's been like a decade. I'm getting back in story shape. So I, I'm working on stories. It's just good to be lit up. A lot of these things will, you're meeting me at that just getting back to work. So I'm like, okay, I have 97 books and I want to open a, I was like, we need a good New York bagel in Toronto. If you want to open a bagel place with me, Nate's <laughs> New York bagels. Anyway, but um, yeah, lots of ideas. So story collection, back to the monsters and the machines. I really, I have, I'm a very slow reader and a very quick book buyer. So I think I have every book. If I, I just find my mother, my um, 
Anyway, we'll skip all the family jokes, but um, I am buying every single book on golems, on you know Frankenstein, anything that touches oh. goat. So I'm super interested in this notion. I feel like that's the big idea, but that may be many years away. And then I'm again, what does it hurt to say this out loud? And I just got permission from my agent. I noticed I had a takeaway. The dinner at the center of the earth was getting made into a big TV show, which I. Uh, didn't know that Gary Steingart in his new book has a lot of jokes about TV shows falling apart. It imploded not because of me <laughs> or the book or whatever, but because of totally outside things. But nonetheless, um, but what I what I took about away from that is I wrote like a literary magic realist thriller Jewish history, but like that thriller people saw the thriller part as thriller enough. Yeah. And I'd been interviewed. I remember talking to people like I was on the spy cast where people told me I loved. I spent so much time, like right now I'm wrestling this story that's, you know, the triangle of ideas, it like hurts my brain, which is what keeps me interested. But I really, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm older now, but I was like, oh, fun. When I was thinking about starting writing again, I had so much fun learning spy craft. I was like, I think I may write it like, yeah. a, you know, my usual stories, but I may go straight thriller because I have such a good time. It's homework now. I'm sitting there annotating Smiley's people. Like I'm embarrassed in front of my, I'm at work. She's like, you're reading Smiley's people. Like, you know, like I'm just, <laughs> I am very interested in thrillers right now as, as a form and friends do that. You know, I was starting to call someone, I was like, I literally said to my, am I allowed to do this? And I was like, oh yeah, you wrote a zombie novel. Like you, my age was like, do whatever you want. <laughs> so yes, I'm writing a collection and a thriller and dreaming about golems and like what, what the modern monster might look like for Jews. Let's look at these. Uh, let's have a look. Can we scroll down? We have a little, you, is there a way that you guys can, can scroll, scroll down so up. we can uh, see the yeah. questions? We got questions coming up here uh, on the screen that have come in from you guys from the, the oh. Q and A, and we can just see the bottom of this one. We can just see members of a particular culture to devalue or make monstrous. Oh, they're trying to aggress. Yeah. So we're, we're talking, we need the We can always talk about ice it. skating if we're stuck. I have I have learned to ice skate and I'm obsessed. You're shinny, all the you're back I'm to so shinny. impressed you know what shimmy yeah. is. That's yes. like, well, wow. I'm just saying, I have to say of the, if we're talking about kind of things like, I have never seen such a green city as this one. It's mm -hmm. There's a park everywhere, but that everybody makes these little home rinks and park rinks and there's ice skating rinks every time. I find that like a shocking, wonderful feature of the city. Did you have other ones on your list that we can, you can get to on your mental list? Do you want to talk? What are you both working on? Well, I uh, actually am working on a book of uh, about children during the Holocaust. And, and then uh, I slide over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rather grim book. I'm looking at testimonies of people who who uh, witnessed what children, what was happening to children and um, didn't talk about it until maybe the late nineties, the aughts, no. uh, really difficult memories. Um, that give me chills. Yeah, it gives me chills to work on it, but it, it, it does make me think about how, um, you know, the, 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 the literary imagination can take topics like this, right? And, um, and turn it into something that people want to read and can read without getting so so wrought that they can't continue. Mm -hmm. and, and and what percentage of people are of living people are you speaking? Is it how much is live interview and how much is document? It's a it's a kind it's a mix. Yeah, it's it's a mix, and uh, and some of it is quite startling. Uh, but you know, I did have a question that I wanted to ask you, which is there sometimes when I read your works, I'm struck by like, wow, this is so feminist. You know, like when we were talking before, you mentioned that uh, in, in cottage.com, there's a little sort of some pornography on the internet that you deal with. And I found that the way you wrote about it just humanized the person in it as opposed to treating the person like an object. And there was something I thought so breathtakingly no, feminist about I'm it. I'm glad the questions were broken. So you got, that means so much to me. That's what I wanted and that's what I meant, but it's not something to claim or to say or to think out loud or I checked those things with my wife like she she called it a feminist book I was like okay like she got it but I was like it, you know it's that's the kind of thing that explode that really can go wrong yeah. <laughs> like writing about a, you know but that was the point I was like you know if we're thinking about this machine you must think there is a human being there like 
in, in a book where someone is trying to, and this is not, you know, Upper West Side, I don't mean like tikkun this, tikkun that, but rep, like to repair, the whole book is about someone who wants to put things right, because I'm obsessed with putting things right. Like if I, I'm one of those people, I thought I, if I thought I hurt your feelings on purpose, that's on me to say, I'm sorry, but if I, if I thought something had, there was a misunderstanding, I can't live with a misunderstanding. Like this is not a good planet for me. I need clarity. So, you know, that idea, I wanted it clear that the main character who's putting things right with himself, with his dead father, with his, with his students, with his wife, with his children, that like he, you know, owes something to this woman in the machine that even a recorded representation of her, like that she deserves that same respect in this book. So someone's adapting it to uh, a movie now. It's get, the oh. comedian Moshe Kasher is writing the script, but, uh, um, um, and yeah, I think that's a very hard, it's very interesting how, when you talk about plays, writing a pornographic scene it will look very different very different yeah so I'm, that of, of all the things if i was him i sweat for him that's a hard <laughs> he, he's i think he's figured yeah he's very i think he's figured it out or very, i haven't seen the script yet but that's what he's working on but um yes I, thank you for saying that that i was already happy to be out here tonight but that's so meaningful to me because that's I, I always say like for years I put like when you know when you know the acher that goes with acher it's like I had a thing in the Argent I sometimes wait I feel like it was in Paris at like Shakespeare and Company I was reading like someone came up to me in Argent they'll just say something that's like hidden that I've hidden in a book I was like it's just for the person who finds it mm -hmm. and then you say like I've been waiting for you so yes thank you for that well I'm gonna have a look at the questions yes. while I do you, I'll tell you that I'm writing I'm starting research on a book about um, Jewish mayors. Oh, and about no, yes. the incredible number of Jewish mayors that there've been in North America, yes. and the fact that being Jewish doesn't seem to get in the way of electorates putting a Jew in office yes. at that level of politics, at the municipal level. But a governor or right. a or a premier or the head of a party, there's a, it's another a different working kind of title problem. is Ed Koch and others. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's take a couple from uh, from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned at the start, your books are so full of Jews and Judaism. Uh, some of the themes, references, et cetera, are more well-known, but many feel more like deep cuts. Uh, this person who's asked the question is thinking, for example, of the wig. Question is, how do you balance exploring topics and ideas that interest you and your characters, even if they're lesser known, with accessibility for readers? This person has been struggling with finding this balance in his or her own writing, oh. uh, not spoon feeding the reader, not making it impenetrable on the other um, hand. Oh, thank you. And that's an excellent question. And since you're a writer, like A, knock him dead, but B. This one, this camera. Yeah, oh, oh, you have your own camera. Yeah, Sorry. never apologize. Like that's, that is the biggest thing where I was like, you just own your, everyone else is comfortable owning their universes. Like if it is explained clearly, you know what I say, if you ate some matzah, you're like, it, it must not be, it's probably not a tool. It's, it's not clothing. <laughs> it's, it's not dessert. You know what I'm saying? Like, you'll get it. Like, so don't apologize. But I also, the larger question is, is that it's the same rules that cover all of writing, which is an act of communication it is about a shared consciousness. Like if you cannot understand a sentence, fix the sentence, that's it. So, and, and the example I've been using lately is like, you know, is Game of Thrones. Like everyone, people will only ask Jews, LGBTQ uh, plus, we're in Canada, two, you know, two spirit or dual spirit. Yeah, Same but way. um, but like, you know, my black friend, like just, you know, it's just, I can tell you the list who get asked like, sometimes sweetly back to the, what if, you know, back to your earlier question about like internalized looking like people, Jewish people read a book. And if it really speaks to them, they'll say, can I give this to my friend who's not Jewish? That's a lovely compliment. But like we, oh, what is the act of reading? It is reading differently. But why use the Game of Thrones? I was like, I never heard anyone say like, you know, are you the mother of dragons? Do you have a dragon? <laughs> like you all followed the show with the dragons. Why is a Jew so much harder? You know what I'm saying? Everybody loves Star Trek. Like, you, you know, you, you ever been in a transporter? So you go like that. It's like, you know, you know, it's like Mike TV and Willy Wonka. You stand in the thing, you go into little color dots and then you're a little Mike TV. That's how we shrink down Wonka bars. Right. <laughs> like we follow all of this, but nobody has a nobody has, nobody has a problem with Roald Dahl except for the same. No, he wrote a the family wrote yeah, right. a, a vague apology. Yeah, we do have problems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But nonetheless, I'm saying you read all this stuff. It's a giant peach. It's a dragon. Like 
No problem with sci-fi, no problem with anything, no problem with the rush. You know what I'm saying? I've never been landed gentry. I hope to get there one day. We'll see how the next book does. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I understand when somebody goes out and says, you know, whatever, harness the horses. Like, I get it. You yeah, know? Speaking of landed gentry, let's move to the next question from the audience. Uh, this question um, is uh, the, the uh, questioner is interested in the intersection of race and class and wants to know what your thoughts are on the tendency for aristocratic or I guess privileged members of a particular culture to devalue or make monstrous the peasant or agrarian elements of their culture. Oh, uh, I think that's probably changing. <laughs> you know, down. yeah, I just think it's that idea like, um, I think you can see people's soul in their writing. So I'm very interested about certain sensitivities. Like if I didn't read books where they didn't hate Jews, like I wouldn't read, like the Russians, I just wait. I love them more than anything. And then they're like, there's going to be, there's going to be something in here. You know what I'm saying? Like, and by the way, like I love Newt Hampson, like so much. Um, the poor Norwegians waited for Newt Hampson. He gave his, I believe he gave his Nobel Peace Prize to Goebbels. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't care about that stuff, but it's even if, so there's two different people, people writing about these structures, writing about these class structures, these power structures who have a heart and those who don't, mm. you know what I'm saying? Like if I read a book and someone refers, you know, uses any of the insults that we don't use, you know, especially I'm talking to academics, we are all, you know, I'm title nine trained, like, you know, but I also, by the way, when they came up with that stuff, I'm like, did we need to be reminded to know that? Like, they're like, right. don't punch your student with a closed fist. I'd be like, I knew this before <laughs> you put it into a file, but nonetheless, um, oh, so I feel like those structures can be explored or people can be seen, but I feel like the real writers see everybody as whole, even if they do that, as opposed to, back to reading the thrillers, I just picked up a, a different old thriller that I want. And it is so painfully racist, not in the good way, where I'm like, oh, you weren't of a time using the language of a time, you were racist at that time versus where I feel like the writing that survives or should survive is outside of time. So, you know, uh, the surf might be your surf, but it's a different kind of surf, which is why Gogol knew to collect those dead souls. Even the dead souls matter. You know what I'm saying? He's doing it for whatever reason, but I, yes. So anyway, I hope this that next question is great. This next one is a kind of a two-parter. It mixes two questions in the middle. So it says, what do you think of the fascination surrounding Jews and spying and then conspiracies around Jewish secret organizations? as you described in your book, Dinner at the Center of the Earth. So it's both about Jews and spying, but it's also about the Jewish space secret, lasers. secret yes, knowledge, right? Well, space so then lasers, let's start, let's, let's, I can't believe I'm saying it because I love to talk, sorry, I hit my mic, but uh, I love to talk about anti-Semitism. But let's first get rid of all the George, the, the not even thinly veiled, you know, it's just anti-Semitic, you know what I'm saying? Like it just, so forgetting all this stuff of fifth column stuff of Jews, not like that's, you know, forgetting the anti-Semitic nonsense, let's get that out of here. And then, then there's the reflexive thing of like, as I said, picking on Jews where you wouldn't pick on someone else where like, a, you know, a different game of bingo where I'm like, the Jew will go to jail for or the, you know, like, mm -hmm. especially America, like the person of color will go to jail for this. And then somebody else will walk, you know, we see this again or again, or like we see like a, the young, rapist from whatever school they're like oh the you know the slap on the hand from the judge and they're like you know send them you know the, we see all these different things so i think there is an interest of uh which goes into the first category that i don't want to discuss you know it's just a uh, ancient boring trope of jews as having dual loyalties you know again to trump to say you're prime minister to his fiercely you know that is so upsetting to me you know this idea i'm as american as anybody else but i think there's the self perpetuating thing that suits um people so if we're talking about my novel which the question is is the Mossad it's like the fear of the thing and the thing itself when a when a spy service has a legendary status I think it serves everyone almost as a deterrent you know what I'm saying so it's not only that it's um things I am I try to be nonviolent. I loathe guns i can't believe that you can you know shoot up kindergartners in the states and we only and now it's okay can, yeah. and we can get and it literally okay is the word that that people are going to stand in congress and defend the right to shooting after like 
our children. You know what I'm saying? I had a friend killed in a massacre. He must be 600,000 people go, you know, 700,000. Like the idea that we, it's unacceptable. But um, anyway, let me stay off, 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 off point. But nonetheless, but as a deterrent, that idea of knowing like the Mossad, it like both serves, you know, oh, I was going to say why I was saying that I'm anti-gun. There is back to loving the thriller. There was something about pulling things off. We all love the execution of a of a scam. You know, there's the, whatever the hot Netflix show mm -hmm. is. Like we like scammers. I think the idea of people's ability, especially in a time, maybe even, I think it's always been an interest, but even now where it's hard to be invisible, like this idea of people who can pull things off. So I think it serves the legend of a Mossad to remain legendary. I just watched the show Tehran on Apple. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, 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 it's both fascinating. It, it's like the novel, the love story. It presses your thriller buttons. It keeps your blood up, and it serves everyone. Like the, you know, I always wonder when I see, like five Mossad heads being interviewed for some documentary. All the stuff I had to watch to write that book to do research. I'm like, why are they doing this? And why are some of them saying truly cold blooded things? Like we were scuba diving and he was a nice Canadian boy, but he'd seen too much. So I strangled him, you know, with my dental floss. And I was like, <laughs> why are you saying this on camera? And I was like, oh, cause it seems scary. I think of the, uh, in, I really did my research for that book, but in Dubai, when they, there was an arms dealer who was uh, killed ostensibly by the Mossad and all these people were made you know, like they had 20 passports, whether they made it or not, or something like that, all these faces, but two of them were left Dubai for Tehran. And I felt like, oh, that's this idea letting, not only did they do this mission, letting them know they've gone into, you know, uh, two countries that truly, you know, or not, not the people. Cause by the way, if you live in Toronto, I get to meet, the only people I meet from Tehran are like, you know, my friend's mothers from Yeshiva who cook food. <laughs> but I was like, here, I was like, oh, you just got here. There's a difference between America and Canada. I had two people who just moved from Tehran over for dinner. Like, I was like, <laughs> do you know, I never get to talk to anyone from here ever. Like, we, you know, it's, you know, or just someone else. Like I went to Cuba. I was like, you went to Cuba. I was like, oh yeah, I guess you can just go to Cuba and go to the beach. Anyway, well, you can get Cuban yeah. cigars. So here. the point is, I think it's fascinating that we just love spy stuff. I don't think it's specific to Jews. I think just the Mossad's interesting. The CIA is interesting. The way I love Smiley. And, you know, I think there are a few legendary secret services that do, you know, have some legendary things that they've done and that it serves them to keep it. You it's know. a super interesting point that the Mossad or the Israeli state has kind of leveraged mythology about Jewish conspiracies in order to make the Mossad more mysterious or possibly more powerful than it is. It serves the mythology. You just never know. It serves it. the politics well, that's for yes, sure. And the things we don't know, they're either more agency. or less. Like, And not knowing is scary and exciting. Mm. So like, that's the point. You know what I'm saying? I have read every Pegasus article. I was like, it's mm. that's not Israeli, but I'm saying that's America. That's the whole world is together on, you know, but I'm saying that idea that like, yes, the idea of access to every phone. Yes, I think that's, to me, it is fascinating, but now I'm a 52 year old dad. So who knows that I'm turning. <laughs> I was like, I never thought I'd be carrying fat biographies under each arm. I was like, give me more books about Lyndon B. Johnson. You know what I'm saying? It's a genetic thing that's kicking in. Let's take another question. Uh, here's free, a question everyone. Yeah. that has to do with whether, um, uh, being raised in a, in a religious family or going, yes. having going to religious school, did, uh, it, would you have been a writer if not for that? Or how did it shape you as a writer? Oh, it's so funny. It, when, when, so anyone, anything that happens that works in this world, you see how infinite it is, like that any of a million things could stop it. You know, I think that's part of what's been so hard for a lot of people at the last couple of years of like the level of disappointment of, can't, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, your private things, not there's been so much pain and death. And there, it said there's something like, is it, was it just America alone? Five million care, you know, children whose caregivers are gone. Like it's, it's horrifying, you know? So, but even on regular stuff that you're allowed to privately mourn, don't put it on your Instagram. You know, I watch, I was like, Ukraine's being better. I watch a friend lifting weights. I was like, he's still lifting, get those pounds up. Anyway, sometimes you don't want to have a split screen, but, um, you know, uh, I don't know. We, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go so for this nine next, hours on. This, this next one is a is a great question. It mixes 
some of the stuff we've been talking oh, you're, about. You're, yeah, I will finish the writer thing. I should finish the writer point. So the, the end of the writer thing is I'm very, this is where my, I guess I, I get shy and I, I interrupted myself. You're like, we've been trying to interrupt you, but apparently you can only interrupt yourself. But I did stop <laughs> myself. And I guess it's where I get, that's when I get my touchy feely religious self. That's why I, I'm always trying to be vulnerable and I shouldn't skip being extra vulnerable. I wanted to do this more than anything. I don't know why, since I'm little people from my town back to, I'm very interested in like, meritocracy and all this idea of, you know, where, where I, I think part of the success of the successful schools, are, you know, like Ivy League schools is not just the connections, which is huge, but it's being told you can do stuff. You know, like I wanted to do a thing. I was really sad that I wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't allowed to be a writer and it wasn't for people like me. So the fact that it like worked mm -hmm. feels out of infinity. And so I think anything, if you ask me if I wore different socks one day, I it's a friend's mother mm -hmm. who invited me to dinner and she was a children. Like I can tell you, I think if I didn't have this one dinner, I wouldn't be a writer, but it's all I ever wanted to do. So I can't say that, but I'll tell you as someone who has, uh, um, I've let it go. Nobody wants to hear about the, you know, the high school football game, you know, that where we played, where I was linebacker against whatever other issue, we didn't have football teams. <laughs> but all I'm saying is um, I think I'd have a lot more complaints I think I'd be a very unhappy like actuary or I'd be like, what a wish I'd had a better time being a child. But since I'm a writer, it's all pay dirt. Spreadsheet, <laughs> yeah. spreadsheet is a literary yeah. genre that you haven't, uh, yeah, yeah, you haven't yeah. experimented yeah. with yeah. yet. But my point is I'm thankful for, yeah. I really am so thankful for, I get to do this thing that I consider everything that happened as just in that front as something that feeds it. And that love of story, I don't know. Back to the extreme, like where you see the, you know, back to the Olympics, the person who wins the gold, like, how'd you do that? Well, we owned a ski, we owned a ski hill and my mom was also in the Olympics. I'm like, that'll do it. <laughs> right. You know, like, so I skied every day and was taught by an Olympian, like that will help you more than the equally talented. So I think having adults so passionate, as I said, no story was made, you know, I can tell you, like you're, you're mentioning Gamara and then the three headed monster came in, but you got to chop the middle head first, you know, like these things, they were not taught as like, fake demons like just you know i feel i skip a generation like i love you know if you're looking at jewish writing i love i can go up across time but i feel really close to isaac Basheva singer because that's he's not kidding like the demons will get you you know what i'm saying and and that's how i was raised let's follow it up with this one so when you wrote tumblers did you think of it as a rejection of ib singer schlemio or helm characters oh no that's um singer gets i i was really till the Till what we talk about when we talk about it in Frank, where I'm like, I had this idea and it was these two couples. And then I saw how that I had the memory of the Carver story. And I was like, oh, I'm going to marry these two stories. Yeah. I Writers talk about this, you make your rules and then you break your rules. But I was like, always whole cloth. So I never acknowledge. I'm like, I do me. I write my stuff, you know, but um that one story is all the Jewish writers that that, you know, to come from Helm to the Holocaust, that's everyone. So Helm is in there. I don't mention the Nazis in that story as that's the Leslie Epstein. I have Gronum, who's the, you know, tied to the singer character. Like, yes, that's that one. Um, no, there's no there's no split from I, like it's it's yes, it's not a breaking of the Shlomi. It's an embracing of everything that came before, because that's the Helm story that I grew up on, you know, like I love those stories, which are just, you know, moral tales. This one puts a kind of theological spin on some of the machine and monsters discussion we've had, because someone wants to know about if the monster in the machine is an agent of evil. Oh, we've got a theological oh, dimension yeah. in here. Yes, but that's a but that's a that's a quickie. The monster does what you tell them, which is the whole point. You know what I'm saying? We build this Internet and these people don't turn off the things. You know, if I was a trillionaire and I had this company and they're like, um, you know, Nathan, they're using your program to throw babies into wood chippers. I'd be like, let's close down the wood chipper part of the site. You know what I'm saying? Like the idea of what people allow to happen on these things to like end democracy to like, you know, violence. I mean, you know, re there's, you know, we can put body counts on. Yes. You build a thing, you're responsible for it and what it does. And yeah, you build them, you know. So yes, I guess I don't think of a, the 
question that comes up. Thank you for this short question and my short answer, but it makes me think I don't think of a monster as inherently monstrous. <laughs> like, yeah. so. Or a machine as inherently yeah. monstrous. Yes. Right. That's well, what you said. Yeah, which is yes. sort of interesting because I remember. But a Jewish, that's funny. Even the Jewish monster does what it's told. Yes, that's how Jewish is that. The Jewish <laughs> monster, you're responsible for its action. I don't Although know the golem other... doesn't do what he's told it at a certain point, right? The Jewish monster. Of bad, yeah, back to, that's how it ties to computers me. That's bad code. <laughs> <laughs> You told the goal I'm wrong and it does wrong things. Yes, maybe that's a place to stop. Are we... Well, we have five minutes. Maybe we oh. have time for one more okay. and then we'll, yeah. we'll wrap up. Give you a chance to yeah. have some parting thoughts after yes. Sarah. You want... Yeah, this is a question about um, making monsters of people uh, on identity lines. Um, and the questioner says, when you do that, it has the potential to embed rather than solve the monstrous qualities of those identities and culture and ultimately root in, uh, I guess like anchor, uh, these, these kinds of cultural ideas about mon yes. monstrous um, people rather than weed out those ideas or correct them. Five minutes and a hard question, though I do wanna send you, if I do write that book, I'm gonna try and find you and send you a draft because that's a great <laughs> question. Um, that is the fun, like there's so many things, people don't have to care about anything. Like that's the whole, point of like we make things have import i keep talking about the olympic my wife and i don't watch it we watch the world cup we like the olympics but like what is it to you know aerial ski, like half pipe skiing what even is that like you declare it important it's not a sport i was like there's no half pipe in nature you know like so um that this is the question of what writing does it is for you to mess up or not mess up it is, that's why I do think it's dangerous. I think it changes minds. I think that's why, you know, I always say writers can't get a cab until there's a despot and then they'll round you up because it really is subversive. You can actually, books change the way I think. They change the way I see other people. They change the way I see other worlds. Like, you know, I always use uh, uh, a friend off camera, but Rabbi Alamadine, a Lebanese writer, like when Israel was at war with, you know, Lebanon, like I was passing around Kool Aids and I was like, that's subversive. Because you'd read that book and be like, you know, we're the same, separated by, you know, like that's what's beautiful to me about writing. So, yes, it, you can totally mess up. The point is, don't mess up. And you have to know in your heart what messing up is. So, when people say, if like, you know, uh, a community wants to hide its, you know, child abusers because that's going to look bad. Well, guess what? People who hide child abuse, it looks worse, you know, whether it's a rabbi or a priest or whoever, like whatever it is, or a coach or, a, you know, whatever the gymnasts, you know, I'll stay on that one. Like you hide that guy the day you knew you fucking protect everybody like that. So I'm saying that people think it's dirty laundry for like Philip Roth dealt with this, you know, I've talked to him about it, you know, um, but that idea where people would say, uh, it's Shalom Aleichem, who, who, not Shalom Aleichem, uh, Gershom Shalom, who accused him of the second Holocaust? That he'd bring the second Holocaust. It's accused, Gershom, accused. Gershom Shalom. And, and it's Philip Roth. Yeah, yeah, that, that he was going to make a second Holocaust, you know, like that idea. And I said, like, I think about it this way. You're going to find out Jews are human. Like, we don't make genocide against you see it again and again. It always starts. They're not people, they're animals. Once you get to bugs, pack your shit and move. When they get to bugs, they're coming. But it's the idea that you'll read about another cult culture and be like, this person has sex or this person did a bad, like if literature is functioning, it makes you human. I think some people you'd say like he aired dirty laundry or more people around the planet had Jews in their home through a book because of him, he did more outreach than like, you know, there's not enough Chabad trucks <laughs> to reach all the people that, so to me, literature is subversive. Yes, you take on these explosive things and you better handle it right. And this is a great question. If you mess up, you could do bad things. So don't mess up, write it again. Do you have any uh, parting, parting thoughts before mm -hmm. we conclude? No, yeah, this is, it's so nice to sit and to thank you. My parting thoughts are, you know, thank you all, thanks for, hosting me and thanks for all the effort that it's such a joy to talk to smart it's so people. wonderful to talk to you about your about writing and about life and about yeah. what's going on in the world yes. well you talk to me sober and now you can talk to me with a drink <laughs> i couldn't agree done. more so nathan thank you so much for joining us tonight i gotta look in this oh, one and thanks to york um it was really a pleasure to talk i always joke that you're kind of a wind-up doll we can just yes. crank you up and you'll go and you know we probably could have had 50 different conversations if we took 50 different takes of this conversation, but it was truly wonderful 
and uh, a great a great honor for us to have you oh you're so York. thank you all for coming um and for tuning in today and we look forward to seeing you really thank you occasions. all for listening stay safe stay healthy <laughs>